everything that we were sharing in worship just seemed to come back to me in this uh, this word that the Lord's given me because it seems to flow right into everything that we were making declarations for. So um, uh, let's pray before we begin. Father, we just thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you that you impart to us. And we pray for that now, Lord. I also pray uh, that you would enlighten our hearts and minds, Lord, uh, to equip us, Lord, in the uh, journey that we're on, Lord God, to uh, lay hold of that which you have laid hold of us for, Lord, that we could achieve our destiny in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. I'll read that again. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. One of the challenges of our Christian life is to hold on. Uh, because it's like everything uh, that we really want in the kingdom of God, everything that we really desire in the kingdom of God, we almost have uh, uh, an enemy that's assigned to pull that out of our hands. Ever feel like that? Ever feel like somebody's trying to pull away your dream or your hopes or your desires, whatever that might be? And when you see the words of the writer of Hebrews here saying, don't throw it away because it has a great reward. And there's nothing wrong with having a reward, the way God motivates us uh, to take hold of his heart and, and his kingdom. You know, Paul uh, uses the metaphors that his life was a, a race. You know, I have, I have run the race. I have finished the course. You know, I have fought the good fight of faith. And I've kept the faith. You know, this is the kind of language Paul used uh, when he was writing to Timothy at the end of his life, when he was basically saying, look, life has been a fight. Life has been a race. But I've been there. I've done that. I've kept on doing it. And I don't think any of us... Uh, with all the challenges that we have, can say with Paul where he says this, I have suffered the loss of all things. I mean, we've suffered the loss of things. But suffered the loss of all things, that's the way he described his life. And yet he said, I finished this course. I fought this fight and I held on. And I'm going to have that reward. Because we do have rewards. There's both uh, temporal rewards and there's eternal rewards. Paul talks about, for every one of us, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for us. A crown of righteousness. Do you ever think about heaven? Do you ever like sit down and contemplate, we're really actually going to go there someday? I mean, I want to talk to Peter. I want to talk to David. I mean, who's your favorite Bible character? Imagine you can actually talk to these people. What was it like knocking out Goliath? I mean, what was that all about? Not just reading it in the Bible, but talking to it. You know what I mean? All of these stories, you know, to, to get a hold of Joshua said, tell me about the walls coming down. You know what I mean? I mean, th that's, to me, it will take all eternity just to, to, to fill our hearts and minds with all these uh, revelations and testimonies of the people that we've sung about and read about all our whole lives. So we have those eternal rewards, but there's temporal rewards, okay? There's promises that God has made for you, to you. There's prophecies you receive. There's dreams that you have. Anybody have them? Anybody have dreams or promises or words that haven't been fulfilled yet? <laughs> yeah. So what do you do with them? You know, can you hold on to those dreams? Can you hold on to those words? Can you keep making uh, declarations of faith towards those things that God has placed in your heart or spoken over your lives? This is why he says, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great, great reward. And I really believe this year is a year where God is going to fulfill a lot of those promises and words to you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. See, what I find is that I have to go over and over and over again the words that God has spoken to me. When I heard Bill Johnson, I think the first time, talked about 
that he kept all of the prophetic words that were spoken over him on index cards, and he would just sit down in his times of, of devotion or meditation and just review them. And when I heard that, I thought, you know, I'm going to start doing that. So I began having like a document in my, in my computer with all of the prophecies. And it's really neat to just be able to sit there and just say, well, you know what? Instead of looking whatever, uh, uh, spending time on Facebook or something else, I just flip over to that document and start rereading all of these promises and all of these words that were spoken. And then coming into agreement with these things and saying, Lord, I believe they're going to happen. I'm not throwing this word away. Sometimes you'll read a word that you got a few years back and you'll say, I, I, I completely forgot about that word. You know, that was a good one too, you know. But you become sometimes so used to words that you don't value and cherish them so you're not holding on to them as strongly as we should. But making that confession is a great way of, of holding on. And that, if you're in, still in Hebrews chapter 10, go back to verse uh, 23 where he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast the confession, the confession of our hope. you got to hold fast that confession because you know how you can measure where you're at in your Christian life is just listen to yourself. And how much faith you're putting into the promises of God or how much faith you're putting into the problems in your life. You know, what's your declaration? What's your confession? Same old, same old. Nothing ever changes. I don't know when this is ever going to happen. You know, I mean, is that the confession that comes out of your mouth? Or are you confessing these promises and prophecy and words that God has spoken over you and say, Lord, this is what I see in my natural eye, but this is what you see from heaven towards me. This is how I'm known in heaven by this destiny. These words that you've given me, Lord, this is how you want me to do life by that perspective, not by my natural perspective on what I'm looking at. And that's where we begin to, uh, uh, I think, uh, fight this good fight of faith in a more tenacious way when we learn how to make the good confession. And I'm not just talking about uh, God talk. I mean, I've been around enough people who use a lot of God talk and I'm around people who actually have faith when they're speaking. Do you know the difference what I'm talking about? Somebody can give you all the Jesus talk you want, you know what I mean? And it just sounds like church. But then there's certain people that you meet and you realize they're really laying hold of the promises of God and confessing them and believing them. You know, and I think that's an important thing if we're going to not throw away our confidences is that we maintain that good confession. I've, I've shared this a few Wednesday nights ago when I was in Spain, how I had to really fight the depression that the enemy was putting on me. I mean, I was sinking fast. And when I began to see that I had to speak to the problems, everything began to change when I just began to declare, God loves me. He, wanted to, he wants to bless me. He's got a plan for my life. And as I was making that confession, I could feel this depression lift. It took about three or four days before this thing broke. But I was able to fight the good fight by making the good confession against that depression. Anybody struggle with depression here? Do you ever feel these depressing thoughts in your life? Well, you've got to fight that battle with the confession that God has placed. Don't throw your confidence away. Hold on to that good confession because the enemy's trying to fill you with his thoughts and to speak his words over your life instead of taking God's thoughts and God's word and declaring those things over your life. So you have to learn how to fight. It says fight the good fight of faith. I mean, it talks about it's a race and a fight. So as you're jogging along, you're punching here and punching there. And <laughs> it's kind of how the Christian life is. But if you make the good confession, you have a, a, a better chance of, of holding on to the confidence that you have in the Lord. The other thing besides our confession is the focus that we have. Uh, when you begin to see uh, the journey that we're on, how important it is not only to focus on Jesus, but exactly what he said to you to keep and maintain that focus. And the Bible uses the word reward. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, Turn, if you will, to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to take a look at Moses and how he was able to hold on to this confidence that he had. Hebrews 11, uh, verse 24. 
By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Okay, That was his focus. You say, how do you do 40 years on the backside of the desert? How do you maintain shepherding uh, a couple million hard-headed people who don't even want to follow God and not pull your hair out and your beard out at the same time? It says he was looking to a reward. He kept a focus on what God had spoken to him about. He had seen something. It says that seeing him who is unseen, go back to verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing, fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. I got to be able to maintain an eye of faith to see the unseen. Because it says we live by faith, not by sight. Okay, so I have to look not only at an unseen God who loves me, I got to look at the words that he's spoken over me, the rewards that I'm looking to her, and keep my eye focused on them. And if you know anything about quantum physics, what you focus on will manifest. Whatever you look to, all of a sudden something comes to life. It's like reading the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And it's not just a, a, a one-time glance or a devotional thing. The more you look at the Word of God and focus on the truth of God, something breaks open in your own spirit. Deeper revelation comes. This reward becomes more real to you than your own very life. You know, one of the things I love about prophecies and words that we have, uh, anybody here like to see previews of movies? Do you ever go into the theater and you see trailers? To me, that's the, the, the words over my life are the trailers for my life. You know, coming attractions, Tim. And the, you know what I mean? So I will see these words and I will look at those words and those promises and I love the coming attractions. You know what I mean? It keeps me coming back to the theater all the time because I really want to see the fulfillment of the reward that God has spoken. I don't want to leave home or earth without it. You know what I mean? I don't want to get to heaven and say, what happened to all those promises? And I said, Tim, you threw it away. You embraced unbelief and doubt and fear and all these other things that basically crushed your dream. Instead of saying, no, Lord, I want to fulfill everything that you've spoken in my life. Like Paul said, I want to lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of. I want to take a hold of those dreams and those words and those promises. I don't want to let them go. And that's why we have to keep focused on seeing him who is unseen, who has made marvelous promises to us. See, if I understand the blessings that God has designed for me, and I understand that I achieve them by believing them and confessing them, then I will start believing and confessing promises over my life and those in your life and the church's life, whoever, for my kids, whoever is around me. If I can wrap my faith around a promise or a word for somebody else, I will stand in agreement with you. I will stand in agreement with anybody. I will believe for my children. I will believe for my wife. I will believe for every one of you and say, Lord, Bless them. You said, I will surely bless you. Yeah. Lord, I'm holding on to that promise. And see, we have to do the same thing. You pray for your spouse. You pray for your kids. And you speak blessings over your family. Yes, it's so easy to just slip into complaining, isn't it? Yes, Lord. <laughs> Criticism, you know? And we get into this kind of negative talk, and we're not even realizing we're doing it. We just think it's life. Instead of saying, no, I want to reverse the, the, the momentum of life and change it. I want to break the issues in, the fa in my family's life by speaking blessing over them. Whoa. Okay? It says, bless and curse not. So I got to release blessing every time I see the enemy trying to get a foothold in somebody's life. I got I to gotta speak God's uh, uh, not only blessing, but protection and provision for every one of their needs. Because sometimes they don't know how to get out of their own way. Anybody people see like that? They're so caught up in themselves they don't even know where they're at. Whoa. But you do and that's why you pray and you confess because maybe you can see the reward and they can't. Yep. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. <laughs> um, where are we going next? Okay. I want to show you something. I was kind of alluding to this on Wednesday night. 
If I'm going to be focused on the reward and I'm going to make the good confession, I have to have a, a platform to stand on to do those things. It's just not a religious exercise. There has to be something deeper. And it's the confident access we have towards God. If I don't know that I have continual confident access to God, I'm going to be more tripped up with condemnation and guilt and shame than, than confident access towards him. Go back to Hebrews 10. If you want to do a study in Hebrews, help yourself. What a great book this is. Anybody know who wrote it? That's like, like a lot of pastors, when they get together, they talk, who do you think wrote Hebrews? I think Paul did. <laughs> but he said, no, it wasn't Paul. I mean, because the, the book starts out, he doesn't say who wrote it, you know? So it's, it's, it's one of the games pl pastors play, or theologians play anyway. Hebrews 10, look at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The new covenant is a covenant that God has made with you. I was talking about covenant a little bit on Wednesday, but God's covenant towards us is where it's, it's him standing before us and saying, this is my undying commitment to you. In the old covenant, Moses read the law to all the nation of Israel, and then the people declared after they uh, heard the law, they said, everything that you have said, Lord, we will do. You know how long that lasted? <laughs> See, that was the old covenant. God makes his declaration of what the law is, and the people were required to keep the law, which they found out they actually couldn't. Okay, So the new covenant was God coming in and saying, I'm making this, and you have nothing to do with it. This is the covenant in my blood. I am the guarantor of a better covenant for you, and it's by my grace that I will keep you and sustain you and empower you, because everything comes from me, through me, and back to me again. So this confident access I have to God, I have to take a, uh, uh, make that available to me every day. I don't care if you've had a bad day. Go home to Jesus. <laughs> Hang out with him. You know what I mean? He understands you had a bad day. Talk to him about the bad day. We say, Lord, you're the only place I can hang my hat because nobody else understands me and life seems to stink right now. But Lord, let me tell you about it. Go there. See, we think if we're in that frame of mind, God doesn't want to talk to us either. And he say, no, you have confident access through his blood to come to that throne of grace to find grace and mercy for help in time of need. Let us draw near to that. Don't, don't let the enemy push you away or tell you he's not interested. He died because he loves you and he wants to have this relationship with you. So we have to understand confident access to God. All day long, 24-7. The other thing is, is, is having the confidence in this covenant. This is so important that you understand the power of covenant. So go to Hebrews 6. Listen to this language that the writer here talks about. Pick it up at verse 13. It highlights basically what I just said. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater... He swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely keep you. Say that. I will surely bless you. Do you believe that? That's God saying to you, based on covenant, I will surely bless you. Can you declare that over your life? That God, my Father in heaven, will surely bless me. He will surely bless me. Not maybe. He will surely bless me. Based on covenant. What a word. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. 
For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is the end of every dispute. In the same way, listen to this, God desiring even more. Wrap your mind around those words. God desiring even more for you desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us confident access covenant these are words that should be the foundation pillars of our life that God is saying here, and when you read this thing, I used to read that word in verse 17, he interposed with an oath. I never know what that meant until I realized God was talking to Abraham. So I went back and read the story of Abraham. And this is what happened when God had promised him an heir. He took him out and showed him all the stars and said, so shall your descendants be. And it said, and Moses, or Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Then God says, and see all the land here? I'm giving the land to you. Here's the man of faith, Abraham says, uh, how do I know that's going to happen? <laughs> the verse before, he's, the, he's, the, he's on the mountain of faith believing. Do you ever have those things where you can believe one promise of God and you can't wrap your faith around something else? Well, that's what was happening there. So God understands. He took him so long for him to finally believe uh, God for a son, a natural heir. The God said, I'm not going through this again. I tell you what, <laughs> I'm going to make covenant with you. So when you're reading Genesis 15, is the first blood covenant that God makes with him and said, look, get the animals, cut them in two, okay? I'm going to have you walk between the animals. That's what they used to do in covenant. They would cut the animals in two. They would walk through the covenant. And basically, if you were making it with another individual, you would basically say, may we be like these dead animals if we break the covenant. That's what, the, that's what a covenant was. So God says to Abraham, get the animals, cut them in half, but you don't have to walk through. I'm walking through because this covenant's on me, not you. The only thing Abraham had to do, it said the birds of prey came and tried to attack the sacrifices. The animals were there. The only thing we have to do is fight the enemy who's trying to steal our, our confidence in God's covenant away from us. Because the enemy will always try to steal that co uh, confidence. So when God makes this promise to us, it's on him. So I can look to God and say, Lord, I'm losing hope. I'm losing faith. Lord, I need you because you're the covenant-keeping God to download to me more faith and more grace to handle this thing, whatever I'm going through, or to hold on to the promise that you've already made to me. I know how that was. I remember it was in 2003. This church, we had been in so many different places when we began. We started in our living room. Then we met in a funeral parlor. Boy, that was fun for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we had a rule in the church. You could join us if you could raise one of the dead people that were in the funeral parlor. <laughs> We met in a Methodist church for three years. We met in a storefront. We met in a ranch house. Then we were back in a, a Quaker school. And I was like, I was so tired of moving around, you know. And I remember saying to God, Lord, you've made amazing promises to me in this church. I, and I'm just losing hope. You know, it felt like, did you ever feel like the, the rope you're holding on to is greased and, you're, and you can't even hold on to it anymore? And I, I say, Lord, I need a knot or something. Give me something to hold on to. Within three days, we had our other building in Moorestown. It was like unbelievable. But, when, but the thing is, if I don't know how to process my fears and my, my fights with God to say, Lord, you've got to send help from the sanctuary. Because I want to hold on, but I don't know how to hold on. He'll send help from the sanctuary to help you hold on. I don't care what the promise is. He, because he has a, a covenant with us, will give you the means to hold on to the promises of God. So if I can understand confident access to God 24-7, if I can understand covenant that it's on him, not about me, then I'm about halfway down the road already. But the thing we were singing about today is, and I shared this our first Sunday here, we have to be committed to understand the, the love of God. We were talking about being rooted and grounded today in the love of God. That is so, so important.
We use the word mercy. You read it in, this, in the Old Testament. That's the word hased, okay? And a lot of times we think of the word mercy in terms of God just overlooking our sins or taking care of our sins or the punishment of sins and God extends mercy to us. Well, that's one side of mercy. The other side of it is loyal love. And the word that you read often is the word loving kindness. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. That's loyal love that God has given to us. And if I can understand that this loving kindness is for me every day, like David said, surely goodness and the word's loving kindness. It's loyal love. Surely goodness and loyal love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to uh, read this definition of the word uh, has said here, and uh, it's one that I just often go back to because it really blesses me. It says here, here is a more colorful definition of the word has said. The consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love of God the Father for you. Whoa. How's that? This is what's available to us. I'll read it again. The consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love of God the Father for you. How do you want, how'd you like to have that follow you every day? <laughs> so if I can understand confident accents, if I can understand covenant and loyal love, I can hold on to the promises of God. I'm not going to throw away my confession, the hope that I have. I'll be halfway through the journey. I will not be lost in the battle. Have you ever heard the expression, the fog of war, the fog of battle? I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. But when they say in military terms, when the battle breaks out, you can have all the great battle plans and designs for the strategies that, that commanders make. But once the first shot is fired, you never know what's going to happen. And often what happens is a dynamic called the fog of war because after a while you're not sure what your men or your people are doing or what the enemy's doing and you're just caught up in the battle. Have you ever been caught up in the battle of life and you don't even know what end is up? Do you ever feel like that? It's like that. You get caught up in the drama of life and you can't even hear God. You don't even know where the, the boundaries are anymore. Well, it's like in that place that you can lose that focus. You stop seeing the reward. You stop believing in his love for you. Uh, a story I heard years ago about this woman. She was a great... Uh, swimmer. Her name was Florence Chadwick. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of her. She was a long-distance swimmer. She would swim uh, the English Channel. Uh, she actually swam from Gibraltar to Africa. I mean, this lady was an amazing swimmer. So the crowning thing in her life, she grew up in Southern California. She wanted to swim from Catalina Island back to the uh, California coast. It was about a 26-mile swim. So the day that she went out, she uh, had a couple boats around her because there was a lot of sharks in that area. So they had sharpshooters in the boat to shoot any sharks that were around. And she began swimming from Catalina over to California. Well, in the midst of her 26-mile swim, fog set in. So she kept swimming, and they couldn't see anything. The people in the boat, this is before GPS or anything else. This is like in the, the early 1950s when she swam. And she kept going and going, and then, but she could not see the shoreline. Okay, And then finally, she just couldn't take it anymore. And she, her mother was in one of the boats. She waved her mom and said, I'm done. I have no idea where I am. I don't know what's going on. The fog of war was that, actually, this is a real fog. She said, let's stop right now. She was less than a mile from the shore when she got out of the water and got into the boat. She had actually swam 25 miles before she quit. That's what happens when you lose sight of the reward. When you lose sight of what God has planned for you and the fog of life, the drama of life comes in and you don't know where you're at anymore and it's easy to give up and start complaining and murmuring and why doesn't God cut me a break and everybody else gets blessed and I don't and I've been believing for so long and it's not... Do you ever hear that confession? Yeah. Do you ever make that confession? 
<laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So when I realize this fog of life comes in, basically to blind me from him and the reward and the blessing, then all of a sudden it's easy for me to quit. And it's always too soon to quit. And we have to be people who are committed no matter what. It was like Jesus that said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He saw you and me as his children and said, those people are worth my blood and I'm going to go for it and I'm not even going to let the cross stop me from getting to them. He kept his eye on the prize. He kept his eye on you so that he could obtain that reward. He said, for the joy set before him, you were his joy. And he is our joy, and we have to learn to keep that focus. So if I can lock in to confident access to him, if I can lock into the covenant that he has made with me, if I can lock into his loyal love, I can keep focused in the battles of life. I can run this race. I can fight the good fight. I can keep moving on because I really believe this is your year. Say, this is my year. <laughs> Say it louder. This is my year. <laughs> this is my year. I won't be deterred. I'm going to make it. I'm going to cross the finish line. I'm going to finish my course with joy. I'm not going to be a casualty in the kingdom of God. I'm going to be a victor in the kingdom of God. That's who I'm going to be this year. I'm not going to let anything deter me from the prize that God has promised me, the word that he has given me. That's the confidence that we have to have. And it's not wishful thinking. It's based on this loyal love, this covenant, Whoa. and this access that we have before him. Can you say amen? amen. Let's stand. Thank you. Hallelujah. Just take a moment. Just get quiet and think of the words he's given over you right now. I want you to visualize those blessings that he's spoken to you about. And simply say, I believe, Lord. I believe, Heavenly Father. You're a good God. You're a good, good Father. Thank you for the access we have. Thank you for the covenant you made with me. Thank you for your loyal love. Father, I know I'm going to make it because of your grace. I thank you, Father, that you strengthen me right now to believe, to hold on, and to make the good confession. Thank you for this, Father. Thank you for dreams fulfilled. Thank you for words fulfilled. Thank you for destiny, Lord Jesus. We believe this, Father. And Lord, I pronounce blessing over your people right now in Jesus' name. And I proclaim like your word said, I will surely bless them. I will surely bless you with all the good things that I have in store for you. The Bible says that God has good things stored up in heaven for his people. Father, begin to send your holy angels with these good things down to your people now, Father. Lord, let them see the fulfillment of these dreams. Let them see breakthroughs in healing this year, Lord God. Let them see breakthroughs in finances this year. Let them see doors open that they've never even known were available to them, Lord. Open those doors this this year, Lord Jesus. Open their hearts to believe for even more, Lord God. Stop having us look at you in a limited way. Let them see you in a greater way, Lord God. That you're more than able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that they could ask or even think, Lord God. Because of your great power which works within us, Lord. Thank you for these things, Lord God. Thank you, Father, for sending the resource angels my way, Lord God. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that are in store for me. Thank you, Lord God, that this is going to be the best year yet, Lord God. This is your year, Lord God. This is my year, Lord God. Lord, live large in me. 
Say it. Lord, live large in me. Lord, live large in me right now. Lord, live large in me. Hallelujah, Lord God. Push back the darkness. Push back the depression. Push back the despair. And let the God of all hope and encouragement invade your thoughts and your minds so that you can make the good confession every day. Learn how to pronounce blessing over your wife, over your husband, over your children, over your finances. Begin to release the blessings. Make the good confession in your household, over your business, where you work, in your neighborhood. Lord, give us that creative power to release blessings and confess blessings now, Lord. In Jesus' name, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, you're more than able. Lord, you're more than able. Lord, you're more than able to fulfill every good word that you've spoken to us about. Thank you for this, Jesus. Thank you for this exciting year, Father. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for the, the great things that you have prepared for your people. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Bless your holy name. Just bless his holy name now, Lord. Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, we return worship to you now, Lord. We bless your holy name, Lord Jesus. You are worthy to be praised. You're that good, Lord. So we bless your holy name. Hallelujah, Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, all oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Lord, we bless you now, Lord God. Thank you for the victory, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, blessed Savior. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just take a minute now. Just ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Just get real quiet. Just say, Lord, show me in all of this. Where do you want me to release my faith, Lord? See if you can hear him speak to you. Here's the next question I want you to ask the Lord. Lord, what do you love about me the most? Ask him. He'll tell you. He likes you. <laughs> He's made you unique. Just ask him. Try to hear his approval, his smile over your life. It's so much easier to walk in faith knowing he loves you. And when he specifically says something to you about you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. of your father is not condemnation it's not disapproval we're either discipled by our heavenly father or the father of lies know the difference listen to him hallelujah thank you Jesus Blessed Lord. Jesus. Now may the
the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance or his smile on you and give you peace. Shalom of God. And all God's people said. God bless you, church. Have a great day. Living under his smile. <laughs> Prayer ministry team, you can come forward.